So Paul Lawson has been with the Cooperative Extension here in Sonoma County for 32 years. Whoa. And so his, his, uh, all of his work has pretty much been dedicated here in the county. And I asked him this, this morning to please stop by the office and bring some of the books that he's authored or co-authored or edited or produced. And so um, on our next break, please take a, a moment to, to reference some of these books all about um, fruits and olives and all kinds of things. We'll let Paul take it away. Did okay, everybody so get a handout right here? We caught, thought we'd keep it real easy and keep you know, only the presenters of Paul. And what right. was his last name? Fazo. 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 Very similar name. Um, well, what I'm going to do is just talk about, uh, I'm going I'm to zip through a bunch of stuff, which is sort of like what you could possibly do, and concentrate on a couple of things. You, have you had uh, some lectures on, on, uh, on land feasibility, how to determine the feasibility of land, how much water you need, evaluating soil, that kind of thing? Have you done that? The first session, yeah. I gave you guys this little um, farmland feasibility criteria that Paul put together yeah. about mm -hmm. soil, climatic zones, water, and, and those kinds of things. So you may want to reference that if you have any questions about those he's here today. I'm going to spend a bit of time on that because I think it's really important, particularly irrigation. How much water do you need? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, how do you determine how much water you need? And one of the reasons is because I go out to a lot of places and they don't have enough water to do what they think they really want to do. Or they call me and they say, I've got a piece of land. And uh, one of the first questions I ask them is, how much water do you have? And inevitably they always say, oh, I got lots of water. So then I said, well, how much water? Oh, well, I got lots of water. Well, but how much? Well, I got a couple of springs and they're running continuously. Well, okay, but if you actually stuck a bucket under the spring and measure it, it gives you three gallons a minute, which is enough to irrigate about a half an acre. And they want to irrigate 15 acres for the spring. So it takes a lot of water to do something to be competitive at it. Um, and, and you don't really get that information in very many places. So I want to at least give you, give you the basis, basics of that. Um, so let's just get going here. So I went to the University of California. And the University of California's primary goal is to do research and education. Of course, you know that already. And then our office, and you've probably met Stephanie, haven't you, and some other people from Cooperative Extension. Um, and these are actually all the people in our office. And uh, Linda Peterson gave me her picture about midnight last night. So. <laughs> but anyway, so we cover all kinds of different things, as you can see there. Um, and my job is what's called horticulture, specialty crops horticulture. Specialty crops. So these are some of the production manuals that I have up front here if you want to take a look at them. So the University of California puts out these production manuals, how to do a lot of these different kinds of things. Um, this one is um, um, one that I was involved in quite a bit, uh, Home Orchard. But you can take this information from here and actually just ratchet it up and use it on a little bit bigger scale. Because it's got a lot of specialty varieties and rootstocks and those kinds of things as well. And then we have all kinds of manuals how to uh, control various pests and diseases on all these different crops. And then we have up-to-date information if you go to our website or this website, uh, fruits and nuts, ucdavis.edu, you can get information, very specific information on how to grow these different kinds of things, evaluations of rootstocks, evaluations of varieties, and that kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, here's one for vegetables. It's called VRIC, which is the Vegetable Research <coughs> Information Center. So you can go to that and get oodles of information on how to grow you know, just about whatever you want. And a lot of my coworkers have put together you know, how to grow tomatoes, varieties, spacing, trellising, you know, diseases, all that kind of stuff. And then. Uh, Here's, here's one, for example, fresh market tomato production in California, plastic culture, conventional production, cilantro production. So there's little oodles and oodles of stuff there. And then on my website, which is this one right here, you got it, it's on the bottom of your handout there, CE -E Sonoma. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff, too. Here, for example, is a list of a bunch of different nurseries, selected nurseries. There's some stuff on gopher control. Here's organic uh, disease and physiological disorder in management in apple orchards. Uh, olive growing, 
um, you know, all that, a lot of the stuff that, that you've got to handle. So you can go there and explore that and go through that stuff. And I just saw this one the other day, it came across uh, um, through the internet, I don't know how many of you have seen this, which is a brand new publication on selling at farmer's markets mm -hmm. from, by Randy McNair, who I've known for many years uh, at the Davis Farmer's Market. It's got a lot of really good information. If you have never sold at a farmer's market before, you can read that and get a really good idea of what it takes to sell at farmer's market. I've sold a number of, uh, of years at farmer's markets so it's quite a while ago. But. So my program is pretty, is pretty varied. I do a lot of different kinds of things. Um, have spent over the last couple of uh, or last few years a lot of time and energy on, on um, olive production and olive oil processing and production, but I've done a lot of other things and have some ongoing demonstration trials and also manage a sudden no death program, master gardener program. So, sort of do a lot of different kinds of things. Now, the other thing that I haven't mentioned down here is that I had a three acre farm in Windsor for about 10 years. It's now a golden nectar farm that's right up the road here. And, uh, and grew a lot of different things and sold them in various markets and you know, learned a lot about you know, how, what it takes to harvest them, uh, packaging, uh, you know, getting it to the market, quality, and prices, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the handout that I gave you actually at one time a few years ago had prices on there, had sort of wholesale generic prices and it had kind of a Sonoma County specialty price. but. That was so out of date that I took the price part of it off that. Okay, so I was listening to your lecture a little bit about margins and doing something that's going to be, it's going to give you, you know, a, a better, a better margin, and and that's really what Sonoma County is about. You know what's special about Sonoma County? It's a great place. A lot of people think Sonoma County is a great place. They want to come here on vacation, um, you know, the clean air, all those different kinds of things. And we've got this great reputation, and, and, and I think a lot of what we can do and what, when I've seen successes is sort of tying in with the uh, success of the wine industry. I think the cheese trail idea is, to me, is just sort of tying in the coattails of the cheese, cheese industry. And then we've got a lot of interest in, in organic and sustainable practices and local. So there's a lot of support for that, or at least <coughs> people talk about being a lot of support for that. But it's not all uh, fantastic. Uh, compared to, let's say, for example, the Salinas Valley, growing vegetables in the Salinas Valley where you can really grow a lot of stuff in the wintertime. It's very difficult for us to do that because we get a lot more rain here, uh, it's colder here, uh, of course land is very expensive, and uh, we also do have a lot of, as soon as you get up in the hillsides, Sebastopol, one of the main reasons we've lost the apple industry, there's an article on my web page about it, uh, is that we just don't have water. You drill a well in Sebastopol, how many people live in Sebastopol area? So you drill it well, you get 10, 15 gallons a minute. If you're lucky, 20 gallons a minute. That's enough to irrigate three, four, five acres, but we've got thousands of acres of land there. Uh, in some cases, as you get closer to some creeks or closer to the laguna, you get there's more water. But uh, one of the main reasons that industry declined is because there wasn't water available to irrigate apples. If we had a lot of water in the Sebastopol area, you wouldn't see dry farmed. Uh, full-size seedling rootstock trees, you'd see specialty, um, more specialty apple um, on, on uh, semi-dwarf rootstocks, you'd see a lot of berry production, you'd see all kinds of things. And water is really one of the limiting factors, so we have to keep that in mind. And then as soon as you get over here on the coast, labor rates go up, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so there are some things, though, um, <coughs> that I would say um, you know, you, you can or you, or, you, or you can't grow, or you may or may not be able to grow depending on, on various things. Um, you know, processing apples, uh, we've got a big processing apple industry, it's one of the reasons why it's dying out. Um, I always laugh at people, I say, well, let's grow, let's grow hemp in, uh, in Sonoma <coughs> County. Uh, well, you grow hemp, in, in, if you grow hemp, what's, what's great about hemp? Uh, other than you can smoke it, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, and I think that's part of the reason why people were really interested in it. Uh, but if you can grow it in the Central Valley and harvest it with a combine, forget it. Because you're never going to be able to compete. You've got to find something in Sonoma County that's unique in some way. Now, if you, could, if you could be the first one to grow hemp and you're producing some cool shirts and fibers and stuff out of it, you can sell for a lot of money, well, great. <clears throat> but then, of course, how long is that going to last? Because a bunch of other people are going to go, oh, I can do that too. 
and do a lot cheaper. Um, another really good one is lavender. We've had a bunch of people, there was somebody who was coming around here selling the idea of growing lavender. And of course, they sold you the plants, they sold you the irrigation system, they sold all this stuff. And uh, there were at least uh, half a dozen places that put in four or five acres of lavender. And then about three years, four years later, I got a telephone call. And uh, I said, well, can you come out and help us? We're not making any money with our lavender. Well, it turns out you can buy lavender cheaper, dry lavender flowers imported from Europe than you can actually grow them for. <laughs> Uh, and so making lavender oil and, uh, you know, those, some of those kinds of things. Now, Matanza, you've been, been to Matanza Creek Winery? Mm -hmm. <coughs> making a lot of money on lavender there, right? Mm -hmm. They have a captive mm -hmm. audience. Pardon? <laughs> they have a captive audience? They're, they're not making any money on lavender. <laughs> they're only really making money on wine. They're wine. wine. <laughs> so lavender is a dressing to sell more wine. <laughs> Come to our beautiful lavender gardens and when you go to a restaurant, you're from L.A., you come up, go to a restaurant, what was the name of that place again? The one with the lavender, remember? Oh, let's get one of those bottles of wine. So that's all it is. It has nothing to do with making any money. <laughs> so you got to be careful when you're looking at some of this kind of stuff. Um, now, there's some interesting things, uh, some, just some history. John Boletto made a lot of money growing zucchini in Sonoma County. One of the reasons was because there was a big uh, virus that hit the rest of California and made Lots and lots of money growing zucchini. Now, the other thing that's interesting about it is that our zucchini is a higher quality zucchini than it is from warmer parts because you get a thicker skin on the zucchini, so the, so the stores love it because it gets in the stores. And some of the things that you, you kind of find out as you, as you look at these things and begin to grow them. Um, anyway, there's a bunch of stuff there. So we've got some other things that we can do. I invited a guy from New Jersey once out here and he said, oh my God, you guys have a gold mine. And we got 8 million people in the Bay Area. Uh, you can grow all these different kinds of things that we can't grow in New Jersey. I mean, where's your strawberry festival? Where's your raspberry festival? Where's your blueberry festival? Where's, you know, where's the, you know, where's, he was, he was basically said, we have a lot of opportunity for pick your own and roadside stand that we just aren't doing as much. Now, we have an organization called Farm Trails and they support that kind of thing. Uh, how many of you have ever been up to, what's it called, up in uh, the Sierra Foothills, the Apple Hill? You ever been up to Apple Hill? Mm -hmm. We're going to go on a cool trip. Right now is the time to do it, too. Take the weekend off, go up to Apple Hill. You go to one beautiful farm after the next, and a gorgeous barn, and they got apples, and they're growing this and that and the other, and then they, they make apple butter, and then you've got apple pie, and you've got all the 25 different kinds of apples you can buy, and have a picnic, and you know, blah, blah, blah. We've got very few places like that in Sonoma County that you can actually do that. And, and I'm not really sure why. I think part of it is because you can grow grapes and make money at grapes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people that would be doing that in that, those really nice parcels of land and doing that say, why should I do that? That's a lot of work. I'll just grow wine grapes. All right, so let's look at the basic land evaluation, climate, soil, and water real quick. This is a map that you can go to and find in Sonoma County. It's based on fog uh, intrusion, fog movement uh, into uh, Sonoma County. We've got fog intrusion that comes in. It's about 800 feet elevation that stops it. So you get more coming in here to Petaluma. There's an intermediate zone, which is coastal cool, and then coastal warm, which gets less fog uh, intrusion. This is, this is the summer climate, no, not the winter climate. This is still, this coastal warm is still cooler than, let's say, Sacramento or places like that. So you can look at these, and um, you can go online and get and, and, and get this. But it's got different degree days um, by by climate zone. But also look at the water use: 20 to 22 inches, 30 to 34, 36 to 42. Um, Frost-free dates and chilling is about this in Sonoma County. Um, nothing real uh, special there. We don't have a lot of places above 30, uh, 22,000 feet, but. Uh, we do have some slopes, and so you want to be careful when you, you know, can you really farm this uh, with equipment, uh, particularly if you get bigger. Um, and we do have some places with very poor drainage and a lot of shallow soils, uh, which it's always interesting to me. People tell me, well, I know somebody is dry farming such and such a crop. Uh, why can't I dry farm it, or I'm going to dry farm it too? Well, if you're on the hillside, you get 18 inches of soil, you can try and dry farm it versus on the valley, and you got eight feet of soil. 
Now you've got a lot of different amounts of water stored in the soil, so dry farming may or may not work depending on where you are. We have some mineral toxicities, particularly around the Sonoma area, Agua Caliente, and that where you drill a well and, and actually pull up mineral water instead of uh, just regular water. Hmm. So one of the things you want to know in your property, before you buy a piece of property, or even if you have a piece of property, go up with a backhoe and dig down, take a look at what the rooting depth is. Very important to know for irrigation purposes how much water Mother Nature gives you. And then you can go to this right here, the Sonoma County Soil Survey map. Um, with your find your piece of property on here. There's a bunch of maps in here. Bunch of maps in here, and you can go to that, find your piece of property, and get a general or basic idea of what the soil is on that property. Now it's not necessarily absolutely exact, uh, but at least gets you in the ballpark. It can tell you pH, it tell you rooting depth, it tell you water holding capacity. Isn't that online now? Yeah, it's online now. But I'm kind of an old bugger and I went online and I screwed around for about four hours and I really couldn't ever figure it out. So I said, well, I just got the book here, boom, 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 I found it in about three seconds. Mm -hmm. So, but if you're an online person and you've never used the book before, then maybe, you know, right. go online and you can find it and make it work easier for you. But this is essentially what it does, it maps out the soils. Uh, and then you're going to take a backhoe for a couple hundred bucks, particularly if you're going to buy a piece of property, you know, get a backhoe out there, dig down next to some trees and see where the roots actually are. This is the soil in Sebastopol that had uh, apples growing on it. You can see that kind of the roots go right down to about there. That's about three feet. And down, if you look down in here, there aren't any roots. It's clay. I mean, there's some scratches and stuff. It looks like roots, but it's not. The roots end right about in here. So you can take a look right where the rooting depth is. And uh, you want to watch out for low spots and things like that for soil uh, problems. Here's one for raspberries with... Uh, uh, wet feet and raspberries dying from wet feet. Here's root rot on some olive trees from uh, from a wet feet problem. This is one of the things that we do to overcome some of those soil wet problems because if we get 60, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 inches of rain, um, one of the things we might want to do is plant them up on raised beds. And I recommend planting a lot of things on raised beds because of our wet winters. Uh, you go online, you can find this. Uh, Plant and Soil Laboratories, and there's a whole list of various places to send soil samples. This is what I recommend, that you collect a sample, a soil sample, and analyze for these, these six things. pH, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and organic matter. And actually, organic matter, you're going to try and change that probably anyway by adding organic matter, growing a cover crop, so that's not really all that important, um, because it's probably going to be low if it's a bare piece of ground. Um, but these right here are important to know. pH, because you might want to modify the pH, phosphorus and potassium, calcium. Um, calcium and magnesium, you would like to know the calcium and magnesium ratio to either add more calcium or make sure you don't have a, an excess of magnesium. And if you want to, if you get that analysis, you can send me an email or give me a call and I'll help you evaluate what those numbers mean, because you'll get a, you'll get a report back and we'll give you a bunch of numbers. Um, so this is kind of what you'd like to have. <coughs> I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there's, suffice it to say, there are specific numbers that you're looking for that aren't going to, aren't going to be a problem. So then you can check off, okay, this soil I can grow, you know, whatever I want to grow. I don't have to really put a lot of time and energy and money and soil amendments and do all kinds of things. So you'd like to find that out, right? And then you can go to the, uh, my website also and find out how to change pH, raise the pH if you've got low pH. And we have some places in Sonoma County that have real low pH. So you got to 4.5, you want to raise it to 5.5 on a loam soil, you're going to add 1.2 tons to the acre of lime. You know, it's just a formula right there, it is till it in and you got it. Uh, this is changing pH lower if you had a high pH and you wanted to lower it to a blue branch or something like that. So you can find out that kind of information. Now, I also did want to mention that, uh, you know, people talk a lot about soil and soil is a practical thing that, that is very important but you can also grow things without soil. And I guess I just kind of wanted to throw that monkey wrench in there um, in the sense that <clears throat> soil is important and it can be very important, particularly from an economic standpoint, managing things. And you're going to manage soil to have good, healthy plants. Um, but it's not everything. Um, and I think some people kind of get into this illusion of, well, if I just have a healthy soil, I'm not going to have an insect. I'm not going to have any diseases, I'm not going to have this and that and the other, and that's a bunch of baloney. 
um, you will go a long way to preventing some of those kinds of things or helping to prevent it, but it's not going to eliminate the problem. So then you come to water. How much water do I have and also what's the quality of water? Anybody have gooky uh, iron water stuff like problem like that? You know, a bunch of people in Sonoma County do. <coughs> uh, it, it makes a huge difference. It makes a, a really big difference. And the yields that you can get, the management, things that you can do with or without water uh, makes a really big difference. All right, so here's, for example, dry farmed apples. Uh, you can still see there's a lot of fruit on there, and I've actually had people tell me, hey, what's wrong with this? This is great. This is, I've got so many apples, I don't know what to do with them all. Um, I'll show you in a minute. This is what you can do with irrigated apples. A lot better sunlight penetration. And uh, let's take a look. I did a trial in, from 83 to 86. Let's take a look at the yields, the differences here. This is 83, the year we started it. Here's dry farmed and irrigated. Not a huge difference. Here's the next year, dry farm and irrigated. Look at this, 27.9 to 41, and 86, 13.2 to 27. So virtually double yield with irrigated versus non-irrigated apples. So I've also done this sort of comparison, irrigated versus dry farm. So uh, one of the things that you can do with irrigation is you can plant the trees closer together. You can have dwarfing rootstocks. You can change varieties because you can come into production so much earlier. If you're dry farmed, you're going to plant Stephen rootstock. It's going to take you 10 years just to even come into production. You're going to go, oh my God, I planted the wrong variety. And then I got these great big trees that I got a ladder to pick. It costs me more to spray them, costs me more to thin them, costs me more to harvest them. Oh my God, you have a very big competitive disadvantage. So let's look at this. 3 by 12 spacing, about 1,000 trees to the acre. 12 by 24 spacing, 150 trees to the acre. So I actually saved some money in planting this. Bearing starts the second year. Bearing starts the, starts the sixth year. Maybe I could grow turf between, depending on what I have, or at least I could grow something and just mow it. And I got to till this now to save water, because they don't have any water. And the cover crop steals water, so now I got to till it. Now I got erosion problems, or potential erosion problems. Um, but I got to have some water on this one, 24 to 48 inches. Remember the what I showed you from before. And then uh, I'm just going to use whatever Mother Nature gives me. So I better have a deep soil that's got some water holding capacity. But look at the yields here. 35 to 50 tons the acre, um, and here 10 to 25 tons the acre. And 25 would be fabulous. The county average is about 13, 12 to 13. All right, so specialty varieties, $1,000 to $4,000 a ton, uh, and of course, the old varieties, because I, I can't switch varieties very easily, 65 to $500 a ton. So it's just like a huge, huge, huge difference in irrigation versus dry farm for all those reasons. Then this is a picture I took up in Washington State. Here's a tree that was uh, just planted. Um, and they actually left these side branches on here. It was planted in the winter time. They left these side branches on here, and it's just starting to grow out now. And here it is a year later. So this is a two-year-old tree now, and it actually has about six or eight fruit on there per tree. You can't see them because they're little tiny fruit, like that. Okay, so this guy harvested five tons of the acre in the second year. No way you could do that dry farm. Um, and he said that they almost made their investment cost in the second year. All right, so let's look at wine grapes. Now, you've got a wine grape grow over here. Um, so wine grapes, five tons of the acre. Well, that's actually kind of high. Pinot Noir would be only like two or three this year. They got higher yields. But um, some of our cost studies use five tons of the acre. Uh, but look at fresh market apples. Potential here of 35 tons of the acre. Uh, value two to five thousand dollars a ton. This is in the ballpark what you were talking about before. Here's the value of one to four thousand dollars a ton, particularly fresh market apple. This is based on irrigated specialty variety. I'm not talking about red delicious or gold delicious. I'm talking about some specialty variety, just like you would talk about Cabernet Sauvignon or Chardonnay. Production cost one to five thousand dollars an acre. Here, the production cost is much higher, or can potentially be much higher because you've got to do more thinning. Uh, you know, more management as far as uh, sprays and those, some of those kinds of things. And you maybe got some cold storage and a packing shed and some of that kind of stuff, boxes. Uh, and look at a net of one to $9,000 an acre. If you look at a net here of ten to $90,000 an acre. Um, this is why you're, you're driving a Mercedes, right? Right there. Corey? Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so this is, this is Theoretical practice. You're going to see the you're going to see the reality of this afternoon when we go out to uh, to the Gabriel Farms and look at their orchard, their diversified orchard. 
but, but you can at least look at the potential here and see the potential. All right, so I guess you can ask one of the questions, well, why don't we see a lot of people doing this? And I think it kind of part of it comes back to, I mean, I think that I've been in this some kind of long time. One of the main reasons is this is one hell of a lot of work. We're talking about the, sp the specific varieties. You really got to know how to prune those trees. Um, you got to select the right varieties, the right rootstock. Um, heart of uh, this pest control is, uh, is is much more difficult than it is on wine grapes. And then now you're talking about harvesting that fruit and selling it in the fresh market compared to a crew comes along and throws it in a gondola and goes off to the winery. And that's one of the reasons why we have a lot of apple growers in Sonoma County that also sell them within the processing industry. Even if you got 35 tons an acre, which would be great, you could sell for processing even at lower cost and, and make, at least make some money because you've got such high yields. But if you can sell it in the fresh market, um, now you're really talking about, well, uh, $1,000 a ton is, uh, is, what, 50 cents a pound. $4,000 a ton is $2 a pound. So there are some varieties that are selling for those types of prices. 